Welcome back. This is episode, we're going back to the normal. So we're at episode 242. We are going back to the old ways. I've run out of land to relocate on video. So uh, we're coming back. And today's video is called how to get in, okay? So I've got notes now and it's not as comfortable for me, but there's a lot of points similar to the relocate videos, but I think I did a good job of uh, going through those uh, with the notes. But anyway, today um, is a two-parter. It's in the same video, but there's a front end and a back end. So how to get in. Um, first, I wanted to just elaborate on some things the government is doing to assist you, isn't that nice of them? To assist you in getting in, and then some perspective uh, on what I'm seeing <clears throat> layered on top of that. See if I have notes, I find I'm looking at the notes instead of looking at the camera, it makes me look less authentic, all this, it's just strange, I don't know. I guess I'm supposed to have memorized it all. Anyway, um, so in order of what I believe is important, if you are trying to get into the market today, uh, there's a few options for you and I just wanted to re-clarify these because a few of them have come up in the news lately um, and some stuff is changing and some new stuff happening so I just wanted to frame it all out. Um, first time home buyer tax credit. If you purchase a home and then you add the number $10,000 on your line 31270 in your federal income tax return, you will receive up to $1,500 in income tax credit for said purchase. This is the HBTC, you know the government likes to abbreviate everything, home buyer's tax credit, first time home buyer's tax credit. To be eligible, you have to be a first time home buyer. As we discussed when discussing the uh, FHSA, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, two months ago, you are a rev either a real first time home buyer or a revised first time home buyer if you haven't owned anything in the last four years. So don't forget that either. If you jumped into the market, jumped out, now you wanna get back in, some of these benefits are still gonna apply. Up to 1500, that $10,000 being put on that line in the, in, the, in the return can be split. You can put five on yours, five on your spouse's, or your common law partner, um, but collective, the request cannot exceed 10, and the maximum return is, is 1,500. Not the end of the world. It's always nice to claw a little bit back, but anyway, it's something, but it's not huge. Now, second, <clears throat> as we discussed, uh, home buyer's plan, RRSP, Everyone knows about this. Uh, if you don't, you've got to be 18. CRA gives you a number every year based on income that you're allowed to put into your RSP. The unused contribution room you have will roll forward. So if you don't have enough to put it in this year, you can do it next year or in five years. The maximum for this now is, as you probably all know, 35,000. Collectively, you can do it again with a spouse or common law. Collective put together at 70. 70,000, 35 each of course, or any part thereof. With this, there is a refund policy, return policy I should say, um, or a payback period. Uh, you've got to have it paid back within 15 years of taking it and you can't, you can start right away paying back, but you can wait to start paying back on the third of 15 years. And then that would be at a rate of $2,692 and 30 cents a month a year, sorry, paying that back. So that's your RSP plan. That is the most uh, long-standing plan of what we're gonna discuss here today and the most uh, heavily used. Uh, one of the big benefits of this is the contributions are tax write-off. So if you've got $50,000 in contribution room and you have $100,000 income tax uh, limit that you're going to be taxed on, taxable, not billable, uh, for the year. You put that $50,000 into your RSP. That now brings your taxable income for the year down that contribution level of $50,000. So now you're only going to get taxed on the year for $50,000 income, not $100,000. So that's uh, the front end tax benefit of that. Of course, you pull it out for the, the home buyer's plan, $35,000, repay it over 15 years, then it's locked away. You don't want to pull it out outside of this circumstance because taxes are crazy on that withdrawal. Uh, once it's in, it's in. Assume it's going to be there until you're 72 or whatever the hell it is that they make you turn it into a riff and then you start pulling it out. That's a story for a different day. So <clears throat> that's the most common that I see. Uh, the 35,000 used, which we're gonna, which is gonna be important in a minute. Uh, the next one 
that is <clears throat> not a direct plan for, for home buying, but should be, is the tax-free savings account, the TFSA. Uh, horrifically named by the government, it is not a savings account, it is an investment account. You put money in there and you buy stock or the likes of, and you let it grow, and then you pull the money out tax-free. It's not a savings account, it's not a put in and hold account. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, horrific job of marketing done by the government on the value proposition of this account and we will dive into a few of the numbers in the second part of this. So again, have to be 18. There's a contribution limit every year, a max. 2023's contribution limit is 6,500. They, the lifetime max to date began in 2009, these plans came out, is collectively 88,000. So you open one today, you've got 88,000 contribution room. Now, a little bit reversed in RSP. The tax-free savings account money putting in, the contribution money, is after tax dollars. So you do not get the tax benefit of writing off, for lack of better words, uh, the contribution room against your personal income for that year. You pay your tax on that money and the after-tax income you then put into the account. The same thing as the RSP, the accumulative growth year after year or outstanding contribution room will roll forward. Um, so you can pay it, in, pay it in later. The benefit of this account is that the capital growth of the account and the withdrawal of the account is all tax free. So the back end of it, you're getting the, uh, the tax savings. Again, these are investment accounts not made for kind of jumping into a penny stock that's going to triple tomorrow and then jumping out. Uh, the government will watch if there's excessive transactions. The goal of this, however, is to put money in and invest it, not gamble it, and grow your net worth. Um, so this is a very underutilized account by way of the stats and from where I'm sitting of people not using it to build that foundational lump of money they need for their deposits um, because it's a very good avenue to do so as long as you're conservatively investing, which we'll talk about again in part two. And then the third plan is the um, first time home buyers plan that we discussed last, FHSA. There's been some issues for lack of better words. I believe originally they were supposed to come out with the plan April 1st, no one was ready. From what I, the research I've done, apparently RBC is the closest to being ready. That could just be hearsay, but uh, I think it's now May 1st that these plans will be applicable. And again, to run through it, there's a video from two months ago, months ago that you can go in a bit more detail, but 18 plus, <clears throat> again, same with tax-free savings account. Um, and both this one and the, the tax-free savings account, parents, if you have kids that are 18, again, we're gonna dive into this a bit more in the second half, you've got to start contributing for them and this is the best place to do that. You can put money in a savings account, um, but this again, assuming what we're gonna discuss and the timeline it takes to save for deposits, I believe that this is the smartest thing you can do here. But anyway, apparently opens May 1st, contribution room 8,000 a year, maxed out at 40,000 in contribution, so you can get that maxed in five years. Once the account is open, you've got 15 years to use said funds towards the purchase of your first property. And then the other caveat here is that you have the benefit of both RSP and TFSA here because your uh, contribution room is tax deductible and your capital growth and withdrawal is tax free. So you get uh, the rebate, technically speaking, at either end of this account. So contribution room is only 40,000, but <clears throat> that's 40,000 more than if you didn't in potential growth money that again, you can invest in there. It's not a savings account, even though it's called a savings plan, tax-free savings account called that. It's not, it's an investment account. These are both investment accounts that you should be, uh, in my opinion, if you can't, but your parents can, uh, not everyone's parents can naturally, but if they can, I think filling up the FHSA to its limit and then topping up uh, the tax-free savings account would be the way to go here because the thing with the FHSA is you cannot use it in conjunction with your RRSP plan, again, as we discussed. So uh, you've got $40,000 in foundational input here, or sorry, uh, contribution here. If you turn that 40 into 60, then you now have 60 to withdraw and put towards the property. No matter what uh, in your RRSP plan, it tops at the withdrawal of 35. 
So does it make more sense to put 35,000 in your RSPs or 35,000 in your FHSA? It makes more sense to put your 35,000 in your FHSA because you can grow it and pull the total amount out to put towards and then layering in your tax-free savings account because again, after-tax dollars, yes, but once you've grown that money, it's tax-free to pull out. So my suggestion here is, which we'll touch on very shortly in part two, is that you should top your FHSA and then any additional money you've got to invest to put aside for that property, layer it in to the plan through your tax-free savings account, scrap the RRSP. It's old news. If you've still got it, you've got that 35,000 in, you can't afford to play the games on these other levels, of course use it. But if you're starting today, my suggestion would be FHSA and then tax-free savings account. Now, where it gets a little more interesting, we are now in part two. We need to do some big like thing to say, to draw the line, this is part two, and it's just as important. I'd say more important. This part of the video is not financial advice. We all know I'm not a financial planner, clearly speaking. Possibly should be, but that's not the case today, so I am not. So I'm gonna talk now as if I'm talking to my children and telling them how to do it. So you're just a fly on the wall, listening to me, discussing what I suggest my kids should do. So this is not me giving financial advice. You all have accountants, financial planners that you can talk to about that, who are licensed to give you that information. This is you as a fly on the wall, watching me talk to my three daughters about how to live their lives. So, um, down payment savings. So statistics show the average Vancouver first time home buyer takes 20 years to save their down payment of between 15 and 20% deposit. 20 years, two decades, a lot of days. That's on a median income of 73,000, looking at a $1.4 million home and pulling 20% of that income out, roughly speaking. So that's a $280,000 deposit on a $1.4 million house. These are stats from a place called Point Two Homes and StatsCan. So 20 years to save your deposit, between 15 and 20%. Now, why the hell does it take this long? Uh, there's a few factors of that that we're gonna get into. Everyone always says, I don't make enough money to slim that down. That's possibly one aspect of it, but I definitely don't think, and I don't think you will think that is the only aspect after we go through this. So how do most people save? From my experience so far, working with first time buyers for a very long time, they saved that 35,000 in their RSP because that was the plan up until 2009 which is now a while ago, but that's still the most common. And then they hold cash for the difference of the deposit. So only 35000 a $35,000 RSP account is what? One eighth of this deposit that we're needing, meaning they're holding the difference in cash sitting in an account over, let's say, a 20 year period to round up. So looking at it again from CRA stats, only 33% of people 33% of Canadians contribute to contributed to their RSPs in 2022, which is a very small amount. And 35% of Canadians only have set up a tax-free savings account. My belief that that number is so low is because it's called a tax-free savings account and I've already got a savings or checking account, so why the hell would I need to set up a new one? It's not clear to most people that it's actually an investment account with a very appealing tax benefit tied to it. Uh, and just 10% of those TFSA accounts have their contribution room maxed out. So again, it's just really not getting a lot of attention. My thought is because uh, the marketing of said plan uh, was not very good. It's just another thing in the cluster of things you, that your bank can offer you, but uh, people just don't understand. Because if they did, I think this number would be dramatically higher. Now again, what I want to touch in on this is some stats that I've got from the real estate board, uh, as well as some other places on, again, we're going back to why does it take so long to save? Now, if we look at, basically the, the, the argument here is the market is compounding away from you, meaning the value of the properties are 
moving in a direction that I'll show you here uh, quickly. We've got some charts that we're gonna flash up here. And the premise of this is that of course, if you've got only 35 uh, thousand in your RSPs, which is one eighth of your down payment. Uh, you've got one eighth, if those RSPs are invested, potentially growing and compounding for you, but that cash is sitting there essentially losing to uh, inflation while everything else around you goes up. So the price of the real estate is going up, one eighth of your savings is going up. Uh, at its own rate and the rest of it is just flat. So we can't assume here that your 20% deposit is dramatically increasing every year because people's income, unless they're swapping jobs every three to five years and upping their income level, which they're pulling 20% from to save for this, is happening because I don't believe most people do that. The bulk of your savings is just sitting there stagnant and losing buying power year over year over a 20 year period while the market is running. And you're actually trying to keep up to that by just saving, which is the most common thing to do and tote it as the most conservative thing to do. But here, I think it's gonna outline pretty clearly that it's the riskiest thing to do because you simply don't have enough leverage in your income to keep up. So, the real estate market over the past 50 years has had four bull markets, which means increase, and three bear markets, which means decrease. That's 77 to 22. So, we can all look at that. The chart is right here. The interesting points of this chart I will pull out is year 2003 to 2010, these are average house sales. I'm gonna use the housing um, because back then you could have afforded one a lot easier than you can now. So the blue line, uh, 2003 to 2010, uh, average sale prices of houses went in Vancouver from 500 to a million. So seven years, it took them to double. Then from 2010 to 2015, it went to a million to a million and a half. 2015 to 2021, a million and a half to two. So that gain over that 20 years, we'll call it, was a million and a half in value or 300%. So that's scary because it's a very big number, obviously. So the people saving to try and get into the housing market, which has now turned into the condo market because the houses are out of reach for most people, they had to save at 300% just to keep up with the rising value of the thing they're trying to buy. Now, for all these investment accounts, the argument here, my children, not financial advice, is that this savings account money that you're being told to, if you're gonna save for a house, keep it in cash. And my argument is that that is not smart, is uh, if you put it in these investment accounts, your RSP 35,000, your uh, TFSA, and then your FHSA, that's too many abbreviations, are now exposed to the market. So taking the general TSX index over the 50 years, eight bull markets, increasing market, six bear markets. Um, that's 79 to 22. Now, yes, it always matters where you get in and where you get out uh, in any of these markets, but if we're looking at a 20 year window, let's take the last 20 years, that definitely does not mean that's gonna be an exact replica of the following, past performance never guaranteed future results, but taking the last 20 years, 2003 to 2010 was a 77.5% increase, 2010 to 2015 was a 24.57% increase. 2015 to 2021 was a 19.14% increase. And that 20 year collectively, you had 121% point, 121.21% point, increase, total gain just in the TSX. So if you just bought the index itself, yes, your real estate would be up 300% if you were looking at houses in that 20 year saving period. But if you had invested your down payment, you would be up 121% on your money. Has it kept up? No, we're almost halfway there, but it definitely would have helped. I'm sure we can all agree. Now, just a caveat on the homes, the condo market, 2008 to 2020, that is the first gap where we went from 500,000 average to a million, just so you all know what we're discussing condos there. So the real estate market has climbed 300. The stock market has climbed 121%. Now the cash, what is the cash done? Which is the bulk of everyone's savings, which you're told to conservatively hold. The cash compared to the CPI inflation numbers. Now everyone knows the CPI numbers these days because it's so dramatically high and all the people that didn't care about it before, the government said we need inflation for whatever reason they're justifying. Yeah, okay, that's something we need, fair enough, whatever, I'm not interested in that. Now a lot more people obviously are because it's so high and the price of everything is going up. Don't forget the inflation numbers is the devaluing of the dollar. The government will tell you it's the valuing up of goods 
things are more expensive because the money is worth less. There's caveats to that, but that's a general statement I will make here. So looking at the money, 2003 to 2010, that first term, uh, 20.51 collective inflation. 2010 to 2015, 12.37 collective inflation. 2015 to 2021, 7.6 collective, which is a total loss of buying power of 40.48%. So the biggest takeaway from this is that it does not make sense if you're starting saving today and you've got a 20 year average window, let's hope you get there sooner, obviously, but you've got a 20 year average window to hold seven eighths of your down payment for 20 years in cash makes next to zero cents. Speak to a financial planner, find out what's the most conservative growth, blue chip stocks, ETFs, I'm not a financial planner, I'm not gonna tell you those names, but if you invest not in the penny stocks, not in the gambling side of things, diversified, and you've got the bulk of your money growing at a rate is a lot better than diminishing at a rate. Anytime, again, I don't wanna to get too deep, fractional reserve banking and all that, the government just directly printing or creating debt. Anytime this happens, it pushes the buying power of your savings down, not to mention it pushes the price of the assets up as we've seen. So as your savings goes down and the thing you wanna buy is rising, do you believe you have enough income generating power at your current position to keep up? Most people absolutely do not. Not to mention if you're saving 20% to put down, as this inflation increases, as we well know now, the cost of living is going up. The cost of your eggs, your bread, your gas, your carbon taxes, all these little things that you're getting hit with, can you still afford to save 20% of the same income? Possibly not. So what I'm telling you my children and not giving random people financial advice is that if you're trying to save for something with uh, that is climbing in, in cost due to the system that we're all in, does it make sense to hold a losing, we'll call the money, I'm not gonna call it an asset, we'll call the money your, your, your down payment. Hold your down payment in something that is diminishing year over year while the thing you wanna buy is climbing in price year over year. It definitely doesn't. Now, if we're gonna assume you're part of the 20% average, it takes you 20 years. At year 15, if you're almost of the way there, now maybe it starts to make sense to pull it out of the market and maybe either hold it cash or lock it into a GIC or something a little bit more conservative so you're not potentially gonna lose anything directly other than inflation, of course, but you need it growing so you're at least combating that, uh, that diminishing of buying power with inflation. It makes no sense to hold the mass majority unless you're using it in the short term of your deposit in cash. I hope that is clear. And I'm going to leave it there. I welcome your two cents. I welcome your opinion. Uh, <laughs> that's lights out, so it's definitely time to go. Um, I will, uh, yeah, I'd love to have further conversations about this with you down below. Because this, this goes against 95% of the people's circumstances that I've dealt with over the years. So I'm really interested to see uh, the contrary. I know you're gonna say the stock market's risky and it's gambling and blah, blah, blah. That's a way you can use the stock market, but there's other ways you can use it to your advantage, specifically in this very dire circumstance of trying to save so much money over such a period of time when there's such growth in the assets and there's such diminished buying power in the currency. Thank you. Like and subscribe, please and thank you. Ask me questions below. This is a very uh, a topic I'm very passionate about, specifically now that I do have kids of my own. And um, follow me on Instagram, I am Jay McInnes. You're here on YouTube. And I'll see you next week. Thank you for rejoining me back at the original setting for this episode called How to Get In.